bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we continue to think on these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you. Amen. An older, an older Catholic priest had become deaf. So members of his parish uh, would write out, they would write out their sins on a piece of paper before going to confession. One day a parishioner slipped a piece of paper to the priest which read, two loaves of bread, a gallon of milk, a box of detergent, a pound of bananas. Well, the puzzled priest scanned the note and then passed it back to the parishioner, and the parishioner looked at the note and then exclaimed with horror, oh no, I left my sins at the grocery store. <laughs> well, where did you leave your sins? Where have you left your sins? Where should we leave them? How can we indeed be rid of our sins forever? Well, the answer, of course, is repent which means, in essence, turn around. Turn around. Go home. I'm going to hit you with some heavier theology this morning and may even go a little bit longer than usual. This is truly spiritual open-heart surgery, and that cannot be done in 15 minutes. I hope you see the value. I really hope you see the value in this message. After all, Jesus' parable of the prodigal son indeed captures, captures the very essence of the Christian faith. It's a story of repentance, a story of forgiveness, certainly a story of grace. It's also a story of self-righteousness, a story of resentment, and a story of anger. It's become very, very familiar, beginning, and we know the words well. There was a man who had two sons. So from the very beginning, we're introduced to three characters. Three characters. The first, of course, is the prodigal. The prodigal. He's the younger boy. He's the younger boy. He's adventurous. He's rebellious. He's determined to learn life's lessons by making his own mistakes. And some of you, without a doubt, can identify with him. I know I can. You've been there. In Jesus' story, the younger son, the younger son says to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, that is absolutely unheard of in that day and extremely offensive. But the father divides his property between his two sons, and the younger one sets off for a distant country, and there, what does he do? He squanders, outright squanders his wealth in wild living. And after all his wealth is gone, this man is in trouble. This man, young man, is in deep, deep trouble. He's hungry. So what's he do? He hires himself out to a local farmer who sends him to his fields to feed pigs. Pigs. Which, of course, is the absolute worst job in the world for a good Jewish boy. Unclean. Well, finally, Luke tells us he comes to himself. He finally comes to himself. As Luke puts it, he heads back home with his tail between his legs. He's hungry, and he is hurting. Home starting to look awfully, awfully good. However, we have to wonder, and I'm sure you have, is he truly sorry? Is he truly sorry? Or is he simply, let's say, posing? Or let's say, play acting? So he can worm himself back into his father's good graces. Well, the fact is, we don't know. We don't know. Some of you may know a young person who's become involved with drugs, and the first thing to go, I guarantee you, the first thing to go is their truthfulness. Many parents today, many today, know full well what it's like to have a young person on drugs come back home, confess their sins, vow to do better, and then not only to leave again, but steal money, steal money on the way out the back door. 
In these cases, a parent asks, how many times? How many times am I supposed to forgive? How many times do I let him come back home? Some prodigals, some prodigals repent many, many times, but never really, truly come home. It's like, it's like one of Garrison Keillor's stories from Pastor Ingfest Lutheran Church in Lake Wobegon. You're familiar with, with Garrison Keillor, aren't you? He says, Larry Sorensen was back at the Lutheran Church. Keillor writes, Larry the sad boy who was saved 12 times in the Lutheran Church, an all-time record. Larry Sorensen came forward weeping buckets and crumpled up at the communion rail to the amazement of the minister who had just delivered a very dry sermon on stewardship and who now had to put his arm around this limp, saggy individual and pray with him and see if he had a ride home. Twelve times. <laughs> Granted, says Garrison Keeler, we're born in original sin and are worthless and vile, but twelve conversions is too many. There comes a point where you should dry your tears, join the building committee, and start grappling with the problems of the church furnace and the church roof and make church coffee and be of use. But Larry just kept on repenting and repenting. So let's assume. Let's assume the young man in Jesus' parable is truly penitent. Let's assume that. Let's assume he's ready to join the building committee and start grappling with the problems of the church furnace and the church roof and make church coffee and be of use. We can sympathize with him, can't we? We can sympathize with him. He's learned some hard, hard lessons. But at least he's back home. And most of all, he's learned how lonesome it can be when you turn your back on those who love you. He's done wrong. He's done wrong. He's repented. Now he's headed toward the safety of his father's house. So the prodigal. The prodigal is the first character in this remarkable story. The second character. Second character is his father. His father. Luke tells us, quote, But while the younger son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. So the Father, of course, represents God. God in all his grace and love. Everything depends on God's grace. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but in the magnificent hermitage, the palace of Catherine the Great in St. Petersburg, Russia, there is a fascinating, fascinating painting by the Dutch artist Rembrandt. Rembrandt called The Return of the Prodigal Son. That's the title of the painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Some in the art world, some experts have called this work the greatest picture ever painted. Now, in Rembrandt's painting, based on Jesus' parable, the son is returned home after going through and wasting his entire inheritance and falling into poverty and despair, and he kneels. He kneels before his father in repentance, wishing for forgiveness and a renewed place in the family. And standing at his right is his older brother, who, of course, clasps his hands in judgment. And the most fascinating aspect of this painting is the portrayal. You've got to look carefully at this. I know it's a dark painting. Look at the portrayal of the father's hands as he bends over to embrace his penitent son. It's said that the hands of the father, the hands of the father were one of the last things Rembrandt ever painted just before he died. 
The father's left hand is not surprising. It's strong, masculine hand, the kind of hand that you would expect a farmer to have. But the right hand is much different. It's smaller. It's smaller. It's the soft feminine hand of a woman. Now think of the significance of that one figure, but with noticeably different hands, one masculine, the other feminine. Father Henry Nowen noticed the difference between these two hands. He wrote a book also titled Return of the Prodigal Son, same title, in which he comments on Rembrandt's painting. And he writes, quote, as soon as I recognized the difference between the two hands of the Father, a whole new world of meaning opened up for me. The Father is not simply just a great patriarch. He is mother as well as father. He touches the Son with a masculine hand and a feminine hand. He holds, she caresses. He confirms, she consoles. He is indeed God whom both manhood and womanhood, fatherhood and motherhood, are fully present. That gentle and caressing right hand echoes for me the words of the prophet Isaiah. Can a woman forget her baby at the breast? Feel no pity for the child she is born? Now, of course, nowadays, you and I in the culture that we live in, we are much more conscious of masculine and feminine images of God. But Rembrandt, friends, Rembrandt was hundreds of years ahead of us. I thought of Father Henry Nowen's analysis of this great painting when I read Evangelist Franklin Graham's story about his own return home after living as somewhat of a prodigal. He tells, he tells a story in his book, Rebel with the Cause. Franklin Graham is, of course, the son of world's most famous evangelist, Billy Graham. And by his own admission, Franklin was a rebel in every sense of the word. In fact, he openly opposed every value and every virtue that his parents stood for, including the Christian faith and all its tenets. But no scene in his book is more poignant than the day that Franklin Graham, the day that Franklin Graham was kicked out, kicked out of a conservative college in Texas for taking a co-ed off campus for the weekend and piloting a rented plane to Florida. He writes, quote, the drive home from Texas was dreary. Maybe my driving slow, I was prolonging the inevitable. I would have to face my parents. I knew that they had to be disappointed in me. I was. They had invested a lot of money in my education, and now I'd messed up. I drove through the gate and started up the road to our home, imagining the lecture my parents would give me. So many other times when I had come home, I could hardly wait to say hello to everyone, but no joy this time. I felt so badly when I finally reached the house and then I saw Mama standing on the front porch, and I wanted to run and hide in the nearest hole. It was one of the few times I can remember not wanting to ever look her in the eye. When I walked up to her, my body felt limp. I barely had the nerve to lift my head or extend my arms for a hug. But I didn't need to. Mama wrapped her arms around me. And with a smile, she said, welcome home, Franklin. Rembrandt. Rembrandt knew. He knew that a gracious God could be portrayed as a loving mom or dad. Most important of all, however, God's character is one of unconditional love. But there's a third character. There's a third character in this story. The elder brother. His story is different. His story is different than that of his brother. The elder brother did not go into the far country. He didn't lose his inheritance. He didn't live among pigs. He stayed home. He did what was expected of him. In fact, he's obedient to a fault. But listen to how. 
Listen carefully to how he responds to his brother's return. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, for all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property comes home, you killed a fatted calf for him. Now notice, notice how he refers to his relationship with his father. He says, all these years I've been slaving for you. Those are revealing words, friends, not working for you, not serving you, not helping with the family farm. No, he says he was slaving for his father. Notice how he refers to his brother. He can't even refer to him as his brother, but as this son of yours. The father seeks to set him straight. My son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead. And now he's alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. Oh, the elder son peers with critical eyes and a cold, unforgiving heart at both his brother, who has broken all the rules, and his father, so eager to welcome his wayward son back home, the elder brother's spiteful. He's angry. Resentful. And some of us understand that. We sometimes wonder. We wonder why God bends over backward to welcome back the wayward and seems to ignore those of us who have always played by the rule book. It's hard for us to accept that Jesus sees, Jesus sees more hope in the much-deserved humility of the prodigal than the self-righteous indignation of his brother. And yet, friends, it's important that we do hear Jesus' message here. We sometimes read this parable and consign the elder brother to the supporting cast, a minor character in the narrative. Well, he's not. The truth is, Jesus probably probably intended for him, the elder brother, to be the central character, the central character in this story. Remember, remember who Jesus is telling this parable to. It's the religious leaders of the day. They're the audience. The first few verses of the chapter tell us that. The story of the prodigal is intended to give hope to sinners. But it is a devastating judgment on the attitude and actions of the religious. For you see that they are the elder brother. They're the elder brother in Jesus' parable, keeping the religious rules, but looking with disdain. Disdain upon those not as righteous as they were. And friends, that's how the church appears to many people in our society today. Joseph Stoll President of Moody Bible Institute began a message on the parable of the prodigal son with these words. I have never known a time when Christians have been more mad about more things than we are now. We're angry about values, politics, television, media, education, the violation of the unborn, condoms and criminals. We're shouting more we're shooting at doctors of abortion clinics. Publicly, we're perceived to be long on madness and short on mercy. We become grumbling warriors instead of committed seekers. Now, you know what he's talking about, don't you? And such attitudes, such attitudes are making it more and more and more difficult for us to reach people, especially young people, with the message of Christ, which is the good news. So friends, three characters. The penitent prodigal, his loving 
and gracious parent representing God and his smug, self-righteous brother. If you're the prodigal, come home. It's not too late. If you're the elder brother also, please come home. I know it's harder for you to see your sin than it is for your weaker brother or your sister, but your sin of self-righteousness may be, it may be the most deadly sin of all. Come home. Come home to the waiting arms of your Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.